you know, having excruciating headaches where I can't tolerate it anymore. It's just kind of a, a pain that's there. I'm not developing any new symptoms. Then you can take Tylenol. Um, the reason they don't want you to take ibuprofen is ibuprofen increases blood flow, and if you do happen to have a small brain bleed, then that would obviously make that worse. So that's why they don't want you to do that. After 24 hours, once you can tell that symptoms are staying the way they are and they're not getting any worse, you can start taking medicine. But then you want to kind of take off the taper off the medicine so that you can make sure your your medicine is not just masking the symptoms and making you feel completely better even though you're not ready. Um, other than that. <laughs> rest <laughs> yeah. is, is, is that's pretty much it um, like I said when you get more into the long-term recovery physical therapy things like you know exercises to help train the brain again are things you can do but that initial period that's that's pretty much it um, and it's not it doesn't have to be complete rest necessarily because like I said it, kids you know they're kids you can't totally take them away from stuff but definitely not exasperating the symptoms so what I tell the kids is like let's say your headaches out of five out of ten you feel like your headache right now is five out of 10. Okay, if you go sit down and wanna do 10 minutes of homework or 10 minutes of reading a book, that's fine. But as soon as your headache becomes a seven or eight, we stop, we rest for 30 minutes, we let our brain rest, and then we can try to do it again if the headache goes back down to a five. You know, that kind of thing. And slowly kind of put activities in in that way, not physical activities, but brain activities. Um, but other than that, rest. Mm -hmm. Anything I'm missing on that? No, I mean, I, like you're saying, it's all about like, and like with anything else, it's about like that gradual return to activity, right? So, right. Um, concussions ultimately have like a, a, essentially you have an area of the brain that's got some decreased blood flow to it, and so you want to be able to do some some activity like they can that they can tolerate, especially with our chronic cases the people that end up in PT are are people that are more than two weeks out up to months and years out, and so. We want to do as much aerobic activity as they can tolerate, but we, we use the same type of thing like Caitlin's talking about whenever I'm dealing with concussion patients. I'm like, you know, I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but give me where you are, you know, whether it's dizziness, headache, nausea, give me where you are on, from zero to 10. And once we go up two levels, like we're shutting it down. Like that's just how it works. So, mm -hmm. and then we'll wait 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then if you're back down to your, your resting level, whatever it may be, then we're back at it, so. And that just reminded me, this on a side note, um, headache is the most common symptom we talk about, but like this girl that I'm, that I'm working with now, her only symptom is dizziness. And so just because they may not present and say, I have a, I have, you know, especially because kids can't always tell you what exactly they're feeling. And that's why anything out of the ordinary after a blow to the head or some type of mechanism. Now, if they just like, I just came up to George now and he knows that nothing happened. And I'm like, man, I just don't feel right. You're not going to suspect a concussion, but any type of impact of some type. And then they say, yeah, I just feel out of it, you know, or I feel groggy, or the world just feels like a shit thing. Basically, feeling like you're getting sick, you know, like I feel like I'm coming down with a fever. Mm -hmm. That's basically kind of what kids will, will present to you. So it may not, they may not say I have a headache, dizziness, nausea, sensitivity to light, sensitivity to noise, and ringing in the ears, but <laughs> anything that may seem different, or even if they're just not communicating with you the way that they normally would. Um, that's really important. And that's what I tell parents. I think that's important for coaches too, is one, especially if the parent's not there with you at the time, communicate with them. This is what I saw. He says he's fine, but I just want you to know that to watch out for things getting worse tonight. If he, if you, you know, if he starts, he's not able to watch TV. He normally watches TV for three hours. He usually loves to eat. He doesn't want to eat. He just wants to go to bed. Um, you know, those are things you need to watch out for. Anything out of the ordinary. Yeah. So let's same symptoms you just described, an yep. acute incident happens on the field, you're in the middle of nowhere, right? You're, it's not uh, easy to stop everything. Mm -hmm. What's, if then they don't feel well, you sit them down, anything you should do, they're on the sideline, they're hanging out, mm -hmm. anything you should do at that point, I mean, that's presumably not an ER call or a 911, but anything to, other than just sitting them and having them chill. Anything not, you can do to help? Not really. I mean, rest. Um, if it's, it's really loud and, you know, there's a lot of fans or, you know, people are yelling in that area, getting them to a more quiet area so that they can kind of relax is, is better. You don't want them to go to sleep at that point just because it's so new. Um, basically, I tell my kids, I'm going to ask you 100 million questions and you're going to get sick of me because literally every two minutes, I'm like, how do you feel now? Do you feel worse? What's going on? Do you have anything new? Anything different? So basically, just having somebody there, it may not be you, but having an assistant or somebody else that can just sit with them and see if they're still able to communicate. Just ask them about their day. A lot of the things, the tests that I do on the sideline are not, you know, people think I'm asking crazy questions. What did you have for breakfast? You know, and it's not even if they, I don't know what they had for breakfast. I have no idea if they're answering correctly, but are they able to come up with an answer? You know, are they, oh, let's say that I have breakfast, 
you know, like if they're totally not able to formulate an answer, that's a, ser that's a serious situation. Um, if you look at them and their eyes are, you know, different or one sideways or one pupil is bigger than the other, that's an emergency situation. So just looking for really, you know, I've had kids that, um, you know, they, they seem fine and then I had one that he just started yelling out of nowhere. He was just, he was just yelling and, we're, and he's a quiet kid, you know, and he doesn't normally communicate in that way. So we're like, okay, that's totally out of, so those are more emergent situations. That's when you want to get them to the hospital, things like that, just to be evaluated right away. But for your kid who just has a headache, you know, feels out of it, feels a little dizzy, sit him on the sideline. If it's hot, get him some water, get him some ice, make sure it's not a dehydration issue, um, and just have somebody there monitoring them until their parents can get there. If their parents are there, I always just suggest taking them home if you can, you know, they're not going to go back in. There's no point in having them sit there. Might as well monitor them at home where it's quiet and they can kind of relax, they can get a good meal, they can be in air conditioning, uh, you know, can feel better in that way. Does that answer fully? Anything else? Is there, would there be any difference with uh, return to play, whereas that's kind of um, with like returning to play to a competition, whereas most also could be competitions are tournament format where it's eight hours or more of play kind of thing that's the kind of state where it often is where there's not that much single game format? Right. That's a good question. I didn't really think about addressing that. Um, Different in the way of, I probably wouldn't suggest on their first day of competition having them do a complete day of ultimate. Yeah. I would say you probably should progress back into the tournament. So if there's three games that day, they only play one game, you know? And then the next tournament they play, you know, if the next tournament's three weeks away and they'd be able to get some practices in, then you can treat them pretty much normal. And just, I would always be, as, well, as annoying as it is to them, Asking, you know, do you feel okay? Everything good? You know, how's you know, how are you doing? Blah blah blah. But um, I would say if you have a couple weeks in between tournaments, then that first tournament I would limit, and then the next I would be, you know, as long as they feel okay, they look okay, and they're doing their normal stuff, send them back out there. Um, if you're, if it's a Saturday Sunday thing, obviously definitely just one game. I would say the whole weekend. There's no reason, you know, see, because you really want to see that 24 hours. You want to see, okay, let's say the game's at two today. They play the whole game at two tomorrow. Are they feeling still feeling okay? And then, if, like I said, if it, the next weekend's a tournament, another tournament, and they've gotten a week of whatever your practice is or school stuff in, then I would say they're good for that next tournament. That's a good question. I hadn't thought about And I know it's hard. It's going to be hard to, it's hard to limit them, especially when they have a doctor's note saying, here I am. But it's just, I mean, as the coach, you're able to say, you know, I'm not going to play you. And, it, you know, and your reasons can be whatever they are. But truly, they should be progressed back into that style. Because that can be a, that can be a lot for you know just like if they had an ankle sprain you wouldn't let them I mean if they got cleared on Friday from Georgia PT you wouldn't put them in that tournament every game I don't think I mean you might but it wouldn't be recommended <laughs> that they play that whole tournament because then they're gonna have some some side effects from that it's a lot <laughs> and if the public school that that law is that um, the same for high schools and middle schools um it's only require schools I'm not sure I want to say it's required for all public schools at all athletic levels okay I might be wrong yeah we do yeah. I mean at all the private schools I work at we do it for all levels because there's really no difference yeah there's no there's no difference on how it affects age groups really no the only thing that's different is certain like um, at the younger age groups uh, like certain baseline tests you do and stuff are not as valid for younger kids just because they don't they can't read instructions as well or they may not understand what you're asking yeah. um, but the recovery period might be just shorter for the, the younger you are the shorter the recovery period typically so other than just changing how long they might um, have out of their you know being out of activity there's really nothing else that's different probably harder to limit them I would imagine <laughs> I don't know though high school you got driving you know, you have all that other yeah. fun stuff that you have to limit them from. Anything else? No? Any questions for George? Um, I, I think one other thing, especially just being in North Carolina, is um, heat and dealing with heat, um, because that's something that we definitely always have to deal with and how that kind of, how, how to deal with it and how it affects kind of what you're thinking about as far as injury prevention. 
what I'm thinking about as far as injury prevention. <laughs> I mean, so hydration is a big thing. Uh, there's been a lot of research on what's the best stuff to, what's the best thing to drink during. Um, but the, the what it comes down to ultimately is that the best thing to drink during is whatever people will drink. Um, <laughs> And so ultimately you're not gonna be able to replace the amount of electrolytes and salt that you sweat out. Like you, no matter if you're drinking straight pickle juice or straight or you know, double strength Gatorade, whatever you wanna drink, you ultimately can't, you can't drink enough of it to replace what you're actually losing. And so the only thing that you can do is, is drink as much of whatever people will actually drink. And so, especially with kids, it's gonna be up to what, what they'll drink, right? And so, um, you know, some people, Hate Gatorade, other other kids love it. So you know, whatever they'll drink the most of is, is definitely what you're going to want to do. Um, and hydration is going to be a big thing as far as trying to limit your muscular injuries too, um, because when muscles get dehydrated, you're much more susceptible to, to strains. So my side note on that will be not only is it important what you drink during, but more importantly is what you drink the day before or two days yeah. before. So mm -hmm. I think reiterating the importance of how important is to hydrate before the game because I have kids that are up, you know they'll come out of football practice and they'll be like oh I, I have three Gatorades for practice today and I'm like yeah but what did you do this morning or yesterday oh I was at the pool I was I was outside in the heat all day at the pool I don't think I drank anything well it doesn't matter what you drink now it's too late you know so I think what you, most importantly is going to be what reiterating that they should be carrying water bottles around school that you know they should be finished base even just telling them the basic amounts that people should drink um, just normal people and then double it. So, you know, like normal person have eight glasses of water a day, then an athlete should have probably have, you know, 12 to 16 glasses of water a day, that kind of thing. Um, as far as uh, treating heat illnesses, which I think is, is super important as well, is just knowing that obviously if they're cr cramping is the first phase, um, so if they're cramping, they should be pulled out of activity. Not that they can't go back in, but you definitely wanna make sure the cramping is stopped and whatnot, and that you have rehydrated before you try to put them back in. Not that I'm suggesting forcing anyone to continue, but I'm just saying, I know, I'm realistic that they're not always gonna sit out the entire time. But more, um, and we can give you more information on this, but when they get to a point where they are no longer sweating and they're not communicating to you properly, kind of like looking like a concussion, but you know there's no been no impact, it's a medical emergency. You need to cool them down immediately. Every way you can cool them down and call 911 because they need help very fast. Um, and that's not going, they could go and talk about heat illnesses for a very long time. But that, I mean, if they're, kind, if they're dizzy and coming off and not walking straight, you need to get them cooled as quickly as possible. But hopefully you don't let it get to that point. And I will, at, at most kids at this age and at this level, high school, middle school to high school, they'll usually stop themselves before, you know, like, coach, I just don't think I could go anymore. I mean, typically. Um, but don't always assume that because we have some of those diehards, obviously, that are going to go a little further. When you get to college and whatnot, obviously, they're trying to prove, you know, prove a lot. And so they usually push themselves further. Um, most of my kids, as soon as they have a little cramp, they're like, oh, I think I'm just sit. <laughs> <laughs> Which I prefer, so. <laughs> Uh, running form. So I coach high school girls, and some of them it's their first athletic endeavor. This could be a long one. <laughs> um, and their their running form is pretty hideous. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can't, but I don't feel qualified. I mean, I can tell it's wrong. Right. But not really adept enough to say here's what you need to fix and how to fix it, mm -hmm. um, other than just generalizations. Um, and a lot of that's causing injuries just because the form is so bad, apart from the knee. I mean, the oh, knee yeah, is just right. oh, yeah, for sure. No. Arm swinging, head bobbing. I mean, all <laughs> kinds of things are going on. Um, it just, But I haven't really found general resources for just how to teach mm -hmm. um, and, and at a non professional level. Yeah. Good running form. Right. Any I, suggestions? I, um, and I, I have to look up what the name of the website is, but I actually have a, um, a track coach at my school who kind of because educated me a little bit on as well just because I hadn't thought I hadn't worked with gate in a really long time um, but basically going through they're called a skips B skips and things like that and it's what you do when you kind of what George was talking about you do it in your warm-up teaching different types of the proper way to skip and kind of learning that in the warm-up and in your training and then that trend you go from just skipping normal skipping with a little kick things like that and then that you progress it into the running form 
So I'd have to look that up. I can get the information at Tristan so that he can get that to you. But I don't know if you have a yeah. resource off the top of your head, but yeah. I mean the big thing that I was gonna say is I, I do mark like I do I call it march training instead of A skips and B skips, but I, I mean I start with simple things like st like literally stationary marching is like the first thing that we do where you're focusing on uh, it's the same type of thing where we're focusing on coming right through here, right? And it's the same, and we're just coming right through there. We're activating the core, we're activating our glutes, and we're coming there. And we're just doing it over and over again, right? And then you're progressing to, to here and then coming up through there. And so it's the same thing like we were talking about with the squats, actually, where it's like we're trying to, to ingrain those movement patterns so that they become second nature, right? And so it, it's a it's an incredibly difficult thing to, to Oh, teach. yeah. I mean, it's, um, it, it takes more than one season of warm-ups but it's just having them know okay like making them think about okay when i start i that's right in the warm-up we do this maybe that's how i should you know try to adapt that into my running form um and so and we use march training for everything from from people that have you know that have the uh the crazy dogs chasing me around right <laughs> <laughs> to um to people that are to people who uh, are heavy heel strikers and that kind of stuff, and so it's something that can be useful for people, no matter whether it's you know whether they're all over the place or whether they're just having small things. So it is something that you can use um, for for really any level of athlete. And so uh, I don't have anything else. I would say though, as far as a resource goes, on the caveat to that, if if they're not complaining of injuries and they've been running that way for a really long time, sometimes it's just better not to change. <laughs> Because then that can cause. Yeah, yeah. Kids. I mean, you depending know. on the age, high school they're malleable. But you know, when you get to our age and whatnot, if, if you've been running this way for a long time, and you <laughs> you have no aches and pains, then it might just be better to continue running that way. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, it's a question about uh, pronation that you were talking about earlier, right. and uh, just biomechanics in general. Um, what, do you, what do you think about orthotics for cor correcting pronation? Do you think that's a crutch, or is it going to uh, help with uh, adjusting your biomechanics, or is it better to just do something else? Man, uh, so I love this question because it's something that I've thought about a lot and that I've talked about a lot with people because, um, so I've recently joined the orthotics train. I feel like there's some PT, PTs are on both sides of that issue, I feel like. Uh, some of them feel like, you know, orthotics are a crutch, and that's not really something that we want to use consistently. Um, and to me, it gets a little technical when you think about how how moldable the, the deformity is, right? So when we're dealing with people that have super flat feet and have for a long time, and that's how they've all.